Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union, a member-owned financial institution. South Carolina Federal is dedicated to serving your financial needs and investing in the South Carolina communities where you live and work. Visit scfederal.org. Hey everyone, you're listening to Code Switch. I'm B.A. Parker. Okay, so is it just me or is it a stressful time right now? There are wars raging in multiple parts of the world. Presidential candidates are saying some wild things. Every few days, it feels like there's some new climate disaster or shooting or public health crisis. And while sometimes it can feel like there's nothing we as individuals can do about all that chaos out there, we still need to get through each day, go to work, take care of ourselves and our people. So I want to share with you all my small way of coping. So, safe space. I do Reiki. And not just any Reiki, virtual Reiki. We're still in the pandemic, people. So once a week, I meet a lady over Zoom, and she sends energy into my chakras. So we are slated to do 30 minutes together. I sit on my couch, light my candle, and place my crystals. And then this nice woman on the screen angles her hands towards the camera, setting an intention. While I feel this warm static travel through my crown and down my back. A lot of energy just whoosh through. Reiki, you know, is actually an ancient healing technique. It was popularized in Japan, but it has roots in many other cultures. And even though a lot of people in the U.S. think of it as kind of woo-woo, I guess with all of the madness in the world, that half an hour feels nice. It's nice to get my energy cleansed, ignoring my neighbor's toddler stomping on the floor above me, or the police sirens outside my window, or the back-to-back meetings I sometimes have from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's my form of self-care. Oh, I think it is. Or... At least I thought it was. I like to say that you can't meditate your way out of a 40-hour work week with no childcare, without health insurance, without access to actual, real, systemic support. That's Dr. Pooja Lakshman. She's a psychiatrist specializing in women's mental health. And the founder and CEO of Gemma, which is a women's mental health education platform. And she's the author of a new book called Real Self-Care, Crystals, Cleanses, and Bubble Baths Not Included. So today on the show, what is real self-care? What's not real self-care? And why the difference is crucial, especially to women of color. Because when you believe that the problem is inside of you, then you don't question the status quo. We're going to start with the fake self-care. To do that, unfortunately, I have to take you all back to a dark, depressing time that I think we all rather forget. So uh, in like 2020, 2021, I like the rest of the world's going through a rough patch. Mm -hmm. And I was stressed with work, with the news, with life. And a lot of people told me I needed to prioritize self-care. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I tried everything. Like, I tried meditating, breath work. I did edibles. I went into sensory deprivation tank. Mm. Like, I did Reiki. <laughs> but, like, nothing was working. And I'm, I was still really stressed. But in your book, you're making the argument that none of that is actually self-care, right? So, yes, with a caveat. Yes. So, you know, buying a new day planner and signing up for a meditation class isn't going to change the fact that 30 million Americans are uninsured mm-hmm. and that, um, you know, a quarter of American workers don't have paid sick days or, you know, the fact that if you're a black woman, you have to work for 19 months to make the same amount of money that a white man will make in 12 months, right? Mm-hmm. So all of the systemic things, whether we're talking about white supremacy, whether we're talking about, you know, toxic capitalism, patriarchy, right? All of these different things. So the meditation apps, the bubble baths, the sensory deprivation tanks, um, all that stuff is kind of sold to us as the solution. But 
it doesn't actually fix any of the real external problems that have caused us to feel so terrible to begin with. In the book, you define it, but how do you define, quote unquote, fake self-care? Yeah, so I call it faux self-care. Faux and self-care. Faux self-care. And I conceptualize faux self-care as the methods. So it's always going to be something that's prescribed from the outside. Like you mentioned, people telling you, you know, you need to do self-care. You need to meditate. You need to go to yoga. You need to make your gratitude list. So it's prescribed from the outside. It's usually a noun. So it's usually describing some sort of activity or a product. It's something to buy or something to do, right? Um, And it usually maintains the status quo in your relationships or in your family life or in your workplace. And it doesn't actually do anything to change any of these larger systems. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's the crux of it. Like it maintains the status quo in your life. And usually, especially for women and for people of color, it's typically an escape. And and we can come back to this. It's not that escape is bad, Mm -hmm. but it's an escape so that you can get away from all of the terribleness that's going on. Or sometimes it can end up being something that actually gets turned into an achievement metric. It just you just reminded me there was a few years where I was obsessed with um, spin classes. Mm. And then I realized I was so mean to myself during the spin classes that I thought it was like making me better, but it was also just making me feel really bad about myself. Well, yeah. And that's a really great point. So the other thing with faux self-care, especially when it's something that gets equated with achievement, is it usually comes with guilt and shame. Either guilt and shame when you don't get to it, when you miss a day, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, that you're not doing it well enough. Right. And so, you know, the perfect example is the woman who comes into my practice and it's just like, well, Dr. Lakshman, you know, I'm burnt out. I'm stressed out. I'm not eating well. I'm not sleeping well. And I feel like it's my fault. Right. Because I know I'm supposed to be going to yoga. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you described with sort of like the spin. You know, when you believe that it's that thing that's going to fix all of your problems, then that gets turned into another measuring stick yeah. that you're using to judge yourself and also to beat yourself up. Yeah. But then why do you think faux self-care is so appealing? Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to be a little bit ragey here. Uh- By all means, <laughs> please do. Well, because um, the entire U.S. economy is built on the unpaid or underpaid labor of women, and particularly women of color, of black women, of brown women, um, of immigrants, of people who are less than in the caste system. Mm -hmm. So we are living in an economy that is incentivized to have us believe that the solution to our problems is to buy something or to work harder. Because when you believe that the problem is inside of you, then you don't question the status quo. Mm -hmm. You don't ask yourself, well, why doesn't my employer give me paid sick days off, right? Why don't we have paid parental leave in America? Why is it so hard to find a therapist who takes insurance and is accepting new patients, right? So the reason that self-care is something that we have hoisted on to the individual is really tied up in not only capitalism Mm -hmm. as a system, but also white supremacy. Um, Mm. You know, I specialize in women's mental health. So all my patients are people who identify as women. So a lot of my patients are mothers or Mm -hmm. caretakers, whether that's taking care of like little kids or whether that's taking care of your aging parents. Right. Um, So I do think that it's really important to think about how much we devalue care work yes, and emotional labor and all the things that are invisible. Um, so getting back to the original question, the real work of self-care is actually invisible and it takes a really long time and it's not something that you can measure or check off on a list. 
And so therefore, like the shortcut, right, Mm -hmm. is to just believe that like, well, I can just like buy this packet of pretty beige branded vitamins that's being shoved in my face on Instagram every day. (laughs) If I buy Mm -hmm. that and it's delivered in 24 hours, right, like that'll fix my problems Um, as opposed to investing in the longer term risky work of looking at how am I living my life? Like what's really important to me? How do I learn how to set boundaries in my relationships, right? All that stuff that's the real kind of internal work. Um, that's so much harder because, you know, we're like living in this system where yeah. people just, you don't have time. So it's like you're drowning. And when you're drowning, you just want that life raft, right? You just want the thing that's just going to make you feel better immediately. And that's what the faux self-care is. So so I want to also just say, I don't want anybody to feel ashamed mm-hmm. for the ways in which you turn to, whether it's like the bubble baths, whether it's like the sensory deprivation tank, <laughs> right? Like all these different things, the mani pedis. Um, because like usually you're coming there out of desperation and maybe yeah. this is a good spot for me to share a little bit about my personal experience. Um, about a decade ago, I had my very own deeply heartbreaking experience with wellness. And at that time I was in my late twenties. Um, and, and I'm a child of immigrants. My parents are South Asian and they came here from India. And, you know, I did all the things that a good Indian girl was supposed to do. I went to mm-hmm. Ivy League College. I got into med school, became a doctor, got married, and found myself in my second year of psychiatry residency at a really prestigious place. Having kind of checked off all the things that I was supposed to do, I found myself like really lost. You know, I was kind of like, okay, well now I'm allowed to figure out to be how to be happy. And I didn't know how. And then I also was really angry and confused by the modern medical system and sort of what I was being taught as a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. You know, I was seeing things like patients coming in and, you know, someone who's unhoused, right? And what they really need is housing, but all I can do is prescribe medication, right? Or another patient who's like losing her job because she doesn't have childcare. And all again, all I can do is prescribe medication or do psychotherapy with her, but I can't fix these systemic problems. And I realized that was a very naive way of looking at becoming a doctor, that I believed that I could fix those problems. <laughs> and anyway, so I was very angry. And so I basically just destroyed my life. I left my marriage. I moved into a wellness commune in San Francisco. Pretty quickly after that, I dropped out of my residency. But by the end of that two years, I realized that I had just been running away from my problems and that Mm -hmm. there's no, um, even in the wellness world or the spiritual world, quote unquote, spiritual world, you know, there are just as many hypocrisies and inconsistencies as in Mm -hmm mainstream medicine and that there's no shortcut actually for doing the hard work of making really hard decisions in your own life like you can't outsource any of that and whether it is you know a juice cleanse or a diet or a coach or you know whatever the kind of like latest wellness fad is you're never going to be able to find your answers Mm -hmm through somebody else it it always just has to come down to you in your own life making your own choices and that's what real self-care is when we come back we're going to talk about Pooja's four principles of real self-care learning to set a boundary is the only way that you can ever make space for yourself and what practicing that actually looks like in the real world she actually decided to take a risk and take a leave of absence from her job, um, a medical leave. That's coming up. Stay with us. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Max, presenting the original documentary, Gumbo Coalition, directed by Barbara Koppel. Follow two visionary civil rights leaders, Mark Morial and Janet Margia, as they work to empower Black and Latino communities, journey into their lives, homes, and the family histories that motivate their united mission to create a more just and equitable country. Gumbo Coalition is now streaming on Max. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Apple Card. 
Earn 3% daily cash back when you use Apple Card to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union. Folks listening to this in a vehicle they're tired of owning are in luck. South Carolina Federal provides auto loans that could help reduce the costs of commutes and road trips. And there's no payment due for 90 days after closing. To learn more about how fast, friendly financing can get drivers behind the wheel and out on the road, visit scfederal.org. Loans subject to approval. Certain restrictions apply. Who's the NPR superfan in your life? Is it your uncle? Your sister? Your dog walker? Could it be you? This holiday season, make a proud public media nerd even prouder with a piece of NPR swag. From totes to decor to baseball caps and beyond, tis the season to shamelessly celebrate someone's NPR nerdery. Clear out your superfans' wish list at shop.npr.org. I'm Parker. This is Code Switch. And I'm back with Dr. Pooja Lakshman. And we're finally going to talk about her definition of real self-care. I think what is different about this work is framing it in the context of our oppressive systems. Yeah. And that very much comes from folks like Audre Lorde, right? One of my favorite quotes of hers is actually what I use at the very front of the book. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you the answer for what your real self-care is because everybody's real self-care is completely different. But I have to say that's such a psychologist answer. I love that so much. <laughs> I can't give you, I can't tell you what to do. <laughs> I, can, I was like, as a therapy girl, I'm like, ooh, I, I feel bad. <laughs> well, and it's important, right? Because I think that like part of the reason that we get caught up in the wellness stuff is because someone is when it's not a therapist or a psychiatrist yeah. talking to you, it is somebody usually who's saying, here's the thing that you should do and here's the step-by-step way. And there might be some pieces of that that's useful, right? But in reality, everybody has a different answer, right? Yeah. Um. So the four principles of real self-care, um, mm-hmm. and I'm going to also just say up front, like these aren't anything revolutionary. So the four principles are – setting boundaries and learning to deal with guilt. So that is step one. And the reason why that is step one or principle one is because Uh learning to set a boundary and coming to terms with your guilt about that boundary is the only way that you can ever make space for yourself. So that has to be principle one. Principle two is developing self-compassion. And when I talk about self-compassion, what I mean is the way that you talk to yourself, Mm -hmm. like actually paying attention to how you talk to yourself. That's principle two. Principle three is getting clear on your values. And we can come back to this because it's an important one. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the decision-making, right? That you were just talking about, Parker. Like this is, this is the hard part right? Mm -hmm. This is the, I mean, it's all hard, let's be clear. But like, (laughs) this is the part where it's like the crux of like, you, you need to use an internal lens to make the big choices in your life. Who, who are you going to choose as your life partner? Are you going to have a life partner? Um, what's your job? What is your career? What do you really want for your life? Do you want that to change? Are you happy in that? Oh um, man, it's 11.30 in the morning and <laughs> those, all of those questions just stressed me out. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, that's why you got to do the boundaries and the self-compassion first and then you can come to those values questions. And here's the other thing. There is not one right answer to any of those questions and you will not know the answers in a week a month, or even a year, right? Like the real self-care process is one that takes years and years because there's always going to be new questions, right? Every twist and turn in your life, every transition, there's going to be another new thing. So I think what I like to do, I think when you're in that place of like, ah, there's so much I have to figure out, instead of believing that there's going to be one right answer that's like handed down, remind yourself that it's actually 
hundreds and thousands of small decisions that's going to get you to your answers. Mm -hmm. And that takes some of the pressure off, I think. Hopefully it's not adding to your stress, but I think it's like there's less of this like, well, I need to make the right choice and more of like, no, there's actually just thousands of small, different micro decisions that you're going to make. And that's what you're doing as you're moving through boundaries and self-compassion and even the values. And then the fourth piece, the fourth principle is that this is actually power. Like this is power. Mm -hmm. And if you were somebody that has privilege, if you are somebody who has lighter skin, if you have financial resources, if you are able-bodied, um, knowing that the power that you get from this, that you have a responsibility to put it back into your communities. Um, that's the last principle, like really coming back to how we center self-care, real self-care in agency. Um, you're a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and in your book you write about many of your different patients and what they're going through and you work with them to create a different framework so can you tell us about Michaela and her situation in the book yeah absolutely um, so Michaela was a patient that came to originally see me for her obsessive compulsive disorder mm -hmm. um, and so we treated that with psychotherapy and with medication and during the course of working together um, her dad got really sick and so she ended up well it was it was actually her mom passed away but then her dad was also not doing well so her dad had to move in with her basically and mm -hmm. so she had two teenage daughters and um, was co-parenting with her ex-husband and prior to this happening, prior to this crisis in her life through kind of working together, she was really excited to start to put more energy and time into herself and had signed mm -hmm. up for these like community classes. And, but then this crisis happened. She's a black woman. She came from a family of all brothers and like, she was always the caretaker, right? She mm -hmm. never set boundaries in her family. She was always the one to kind of step in, do the thing, take care of everything, lend people money, plan all the holidays, right? And so this all kind of came to a head while we were working together and her OCD got a lot worse. Mm. So what her decision making, you know, was she actually decided to take a risk and take a leave of absence from her job, um, a medical leave. And during that time was able to, um, you know, see me more regularly. We were able to get a handle on her anxiety, also figure out a plan for taking care of her father and and asking actually her brothers for some money to chip in um, all these different pieces. But, you know, the fear of making that choice, especially mm -hmm. as a black woman, she was really worried about how she would be perceived, whether she would lose her job, whether she would, you know, not get that next promotion, right? All this stuff. And then what actually ended up happening is through this process, when she came back and she connected with another person at her workplace who actually had a family member with OCD, a kid, and they started these little kind of like um, talks at work that were kind of a support space for others at the company who were dealing with mental health issues. And when she was up for like her next performance review, she actually was praised for this. And um, and they started kind of like something that was similar to like an ERG where she actually got some funding for it. Okay. And so the thing that she was really worried about that would hold her back and that she would be penalized for ended up actually being something that was fully celebrated in her workplace. And none of that would have happened unless she... Like the first thread in all of that for her was starting to set boundaries inside her family, actually. Mm -hmm. So I guess I want to say two things on that. You know, there's parts of the book where I, I have these little sections where like that are sort of like, yeah, sounds great. But which is like my patients who are like, yeah, yeah. it sounds great, Dr. Lakshman. Like, OK, awesome. But like my employer is never going to like do that for me. <laughs> you know, my yeah. family is terrible. They're not going to, you know. And so I'm not saying that it all works out great. Like, you know, she still is has struggles, right? It's it, This yeah. is all hard stuff. But I think that and especially if you're somebody who is a person of color or in particular a black person in corporate America, we do know that you will be penalized, right? Like that's yeah. not imaginary right? That's not in your head. Like that's a very real thing. So you have to figure out when is it worth taking the risk and um, 
what are the potential costs of the risk? And there will be some times where it's not worth it. And there will be other times where it is. So when I talk about boundaries, actually, it's worth clarifying here. Um, So my definition of boundaries is a little bit different. I think about boundaries as the pause. Mm. And then you can say yes, you can say no, or you can negotiate. And then in the case of Michaela, it's like doing the calculus of like, okay, yeah, my mental health is really, really bad. And yeah, it's a risk for me to ask for this leave. But if I don't, I'm probably going to deteriorate to the point where like, I might get fired. Yeah, because there's this great line right in one of your chapters. It's like, our entire system is built on the premise that women's time, especially the time of black and brown women, doesn't belong to them. And setting boundaries is how to take time, energy, and attention back. And that really struck with me. And I was like, oh, no. Um, (laughs) And I really love the examples that you gave of two Black female athletes, Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles. Mm -hmm. For those who need a reminder, Naomi Osaka is a professional tennis player. Simone Biles is one of the most decorated American Olympic gymnasts. And they both stepped away from their sports at very high-profile moments in 2021. Like, when I win, I don't feel happy. I feel more like a relief. Um, And then when I lose, I feel very sad. And I don't don't think that's normal. (laughs) But I I think I'm going to take a break from playing for a while. I say um, put mental health first because... If you don't, then you're not going to enjoy your sport and you're not going to succeed as much as you want to. Could you tell us about how you see them as practicing real self-care? Yeah, yeah. So for both of those spectacular female athletes, on one hand, you can think of it as like, oh, these are huge superstars, you know, they have tons of money, et cetera. But on the other hand, the way that I think of it as a psychiatrist as well, these are two young black women who have the weight of the world on their shoulders, Mm. like in so many people depending on them to bring in money. Right. And such high expectations that other people have and, and that they have, I would imagine they have for their careers. And then to step back and say, you know what, my mental health matters. My mental health is the most important thing. And to do that on a global stage while all the eyes are watching You know, I don't, again, I don't know anything about their own internal processes, but that looked so much like real self-care to me. And that also, I feel like, was just such a poignant example of the power dynamic there. These are, again, two young Black women athletes, um, and and there's plenty of non-Black folks who are making lots of money off of (laughs) their performances, right? And again, but for them to say, Like, I matter. I matter. And I'm going to trust that I can come back and I can do whatever I want, right? That that this isn't a failing. Like, that this is power to do this. Yeah. The thing with real self-care is there is a cost. Like, there's, like, an emotional cost, sometimes a monetary cost, societal cost. And there is also... I mean, you have these high-profile people like Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles who are out here doing real self-care, knowing what the, like you say, weighing the risks. Um, and I think about someone who may not be in, like, the spotlight or in the, like, even me, I'm in a position of privilege where I can say no to certain things or be like, I'm going to take the afternoon off and go see John Wick or something. Like I think about people who are in a less privileged situation. Is it possible for them to exercise real self-care? I think it is. Um, I think it looks different everywhere in every different sort of station of life. Mm -hmm. Um, When I talk about this question, the thing that always comes to mind for me is when I was a medical student. And I know that obviously even being able to be a medical student Mm -hmm. in America is a hugely privileged position to be in. And the reason that I use it as an example is because I felt at that time like I had zero choices and I was at the bottom of the ladder because I was in the medical hierarchy. And Mm -hmm. 
this was back in like 2009 ish, maybe. Um, and I was a third year med student on my surgery rotation at a hospital in North Philly. Um, and my team didn't know my name. What? Yeah. Like it was just like, hey, med student. No, you know, no. Can you grab this? Yes. And so for me, in, in that time of my life, real self care was asking to be called by my name. <laughs> oh. And that's why boundaries are a pause, right? You take the pause and then you, yeah, like you might be working three jobs and you might have to work three jobs in order to make ends meet. And there isn't a place that you feel like you can say no yet, right? But if a boundary is the pause, at least you can take that pause and start to think briefly of like, yeah. okay, what needs to change so that I could get to a place to say no? And usually that is something economic and usually that is something that is social and collective. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to ask, like, when you're mm-hmm. pushing for something like saying your actual name, I getting mm-hmm. called your name, is that changing the overall dynamic? Because it doesn't feel 100% that way. That's a good question. I mean, the medical system still is absolutely terrible and abusive and traumatic. So no, me saying my name did not <laughs> go very yeah. far. But for me personally, that was part of a journey of figuring out, deciding to become a psychiatrist mm-hmm. too, right? So you don't know where it's going to kind of take you in terms, of, again, that's why real self-care isn't prescriptive and why I keep saying that it's sort of like it's a thousand small decisions. It's not just like one big thing. You write that the problems affecting women of color are structural. Like I've been in positions where like the microaggressions come at you left and right and and you're trying to like, there's like pay issues. There's like all of these things that are really in our control, but these changes need to be internal and have you found ways to kind of circle that square how can you circle that square yeah you know i have probably a depressing answer to this um i'll take it (laughs) which is i don't i have probably lost faith in sort of the establishment like i think the answers have to come from people that are outside of the systems Um, because I think inside the system, whether we're talking about healthcare, academics, whether we're talking about law, banking, whatever, all the different industries, um, when you're inside the system as a person of color, the cost of trying to change that particular system is so, so high Yeah, on your own mental health. It's funny that the self-care that you're talking about does seem deeply communal and not the classic like quote-unquote self that we think of yeah because real self-care is interpersonal and communal i know we hear a lot about community care Mm -hmm. and maybe in writing this book it's a little bit of a trojan horse in that i feel like more people will read it when it's called real self-care as opposed to calling it community care, even though what I am really speaking to is taking care of each other too. But I think that you got to take care of yourself first. Like that has to be step one. I mean, again, it's, ho- it's so hard. <laughs> it, 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 it involves like maybe five extra brain cells that I don't know if I have right now. This also... For lack of a better word, it's not. It's like it's not sexy. How do we like? Is, you give me like bath salts. If you give, if you give me like one of those like huge like, I got a bath bomb for my birthday. That's like the shape of the like the earth, like <laughs> things like that. How do you sell this version of self care to the people who need it the most? Yeah, yeah. Are you telling me you're doing, I'm doing a terrible job of selling it right now? No, you're doing great. <laughs> you're doing great. I mean, um, it's still a little bleak, but that's kind of what you expect. Because, <laughs> like, you also, like, you say, like, you start at the idea that we suffer and we try mm-hmm. to improve, mm-hmm. dis- like, despite the suffering. Mm-hmm. So already, mm-hmm. we're, it's bleak, but mm-hmm. it's okay. I'm already, w- I'm with you. <laughs> well, you know what? Like, I think my answer to that would be that I'm not trying to sell it. Like, I think you come to it when you've done everything else and it hasn't worked. 
right? And this is like, this is, you need a companion to get through, right? And maybe what I'll say is I don't have the solution, like all the answers and all the solutions. What I do have is the beginning of a new conversation. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. It's not the answer. It's the beginning of a conversation. And I think you're asking me like, is it even worth having this conversation? And like, I'm just saying, yes, yes, yes. Okay, my last question. Is my Reiki real self-care or faux self-care? I don't know about whether, like, there's anything actually specific about that specific thing. But to me, this actually sounds like the practice of taking that time out, having it once a week, having it feel like it's something that you're doing for yourself is the value. So then I would wonder if you, can you figure out a way to do that for yourself that's not Reiki, but Ooh. that is maybe looking at places in your life where you want to set a boundary and giving yourself maybe 30 minutes to think about what is that boundaries practice going to look like? What is that first thing that you're going to set a boundary with? Now yeah, you've made it less fun <laughs> <laughs> right it's it is All less right. fun it is less fun but it's putting it back into your own hands that's dr Pooja lakshman she's a practicing psychiatrist and the author of the new book real self-care crystals cleanses and bubble baths not included that's our show you can follow us on instagram at npr code switch if email is more your thing ours is code switch at npr.org we want to take a minute to say thank you so much to our code switch plus supporters and anyone listening who donates to public media after all public media means that you the public support it everything you hear from the npr network really does depend on your contributions and for anyone listening who isn't a supporter yet, right now is a great time to get actively involved in creating a more informed public. That's our whole mission at NPR. That's why we're here. If you like perks, Code Switch Plus offers sponsor-free listening. If you just want to make a tax-deductible donation to your favorite station or stations in the NPR network, that's great, too. We've even had NPR Plus subscribers make additional contributions. What really matters is that you are part of the community that makes this work possible. The donation now funds the news and podcasts that expand your horizons, connect you to exciting ideas and people, and inspire you every day. Please give today at donate.npr.org slash codeswitch or explore NPR Plus at plus.npr.org. Thanks. This episode was produced by Diba Modisham with help from Christina Kala. It was edited by Leah Danella. Our engineer was James Willits. Episode art was designed by L.A. Johnson. And a big shout out to the rest of the Code Switch Massive. Karen Grigsby Bates, Alyssa Jung Perry, Kamari Devarajan, Xavier Lopez, Dahlia Mortada, Jess Kong, Courtney Stein, Steve Drummond, Virlin Williams, Jean Demby, and Lori Lizaraga. I'm B.A. Parker. Hydrate. You can't just keep going to sensory deprivation tanks. Don't do it. I mean, you can if you want to, but I imagine they're really expensive. And I did it wrong. I thought I was doing it wrong the whole time, and I was mad at myself that I did, was, wasn't doing it properly. <laughs> this message comes from NPR sponsor, Doctors Without Borders. Around the world, Doctors Without Borders provides medical care wherever it's needed most. This Giving Week, make a life-saving impact. Learn more at doctorswithoutborders.org slash NPR. Support for NPR and the following message come from Sattva. Sattva luxury mattresses are every bit as elegant as the most expensive brands, but because they're sold online, they're about half the price. Visit com slash NPR and save an additional $200. On It's Been a Minute, we talk to up-and-comers and icons of culture. 
From Barbara Streisand. You're such a wonderful interviewer. To Tracy Ellis Ross. Your questions were so wonderful. And Christine Baranski. Oh, thank you for your wonderful questions. Hear the questions these icons loved to be asked. Listen every week to It's Been a Minute from NPR.